The United States just landed on the moon for the first time in over 50 years. Success. Welcome to the moon. Successfully landed. And it was a public company that did so, not the government. Intuitive machines. Intuitive machines. Intuitive machines. We are entering a new era of space exploration. This video is the ultimate guide to the current race for the moon. Why are we going? Who's in this race? How are we doing it? What challenges are we facing? And what comes next? Three, two, one. Boosters and ignition and liftoff of Artemis 1. This view of Earth captured from a human rated spacecraft not seen since 1972 during the final Apollo mission some 50 years ago. Okay, why do we even care about going to the moon? Well, our quest to explore the moon and even set up a permanent base there is driven by four things, exploration, science, technology development, and even politics. Even though Mars is the big exploration goal of our lifetimes, it's a pretty risky thing to just go straight there. And quite frankly, we don't really have the technology we need to safely and reliably go there. That's why there's so much focus on the moon right now, because we can use it as a stepping stone and a proving ground for Mars and other solar system exploration. We do need to talk about why we're exploring the solar system in the first place, because I think the most common question I get from skeptics is why? Like, why would you do that? We have so many problems here on Earth to fix. And I think that these are totally valid questions, but what they forget is that humans are explorers. We are curious creatures, curious beings by nature, and we've been explorers for our entire existence. We've also had problems for our entire existence, but that's never stopped us from exploring before. So why then is the argument that we shouldn't be continuing our exploration into the solar system just because we have problems here on Earth? And look at all of the ways that our past exploration has helped us solve the problems that we have faced. Why is the argument that solar system exploration isn't going to do just that as well? I honestly don't know because the argument is just wrong. Okay, back to the moon. So the moon being much closer is a much safer place for us to go and test out living off earth for the first time. It's only a few days trip and the communications delay is pretty negligible. So if anything were to ever come up where the astronauts on the moon needed support from earth, they could do so in pretty much near real time, rather a 10 to 40 minute communications delay if they were to be on Mars. We also need to figure out how to live off Earth sustainably. We can't rely on Earth's resources when it takes six to nine months to go to Mars, and of course even longer for further. NASA has this mantra for Mars exploration called follow the water, and that's because where there is water, there is life as we know it. Well, we're doing the same thing for the moon because water can support our life. In 2008, we definitively found water on the moon, and since then, we just keep finding more and more. Not only can we purify that water for drinking, but we can also electrolyte it into hydrogen and oxygen and we can use the hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel and we can use the oxygen for our habitats. This is sustainable space exploration using what we call in situ resources or resources that are naturally found on that planet or moon or wherever to support life in our exploration. And once we have the necessary technology and infrastructure set up on the moon to support this resource extraction and production, it will cut down on the cost of these missions dramatically. This type of in situ resource utilization, or ISRU as the industry calls it because we love our acronyms, is something we also want to apply to building materials. It would be really inefficient and not cost effective at all to just send everything from Earth. While we will have to do that to begin with, there will be a future where we will mine the lunar dirt and 3D print it into buildings and habitats and transportation networks and even power stations. Plus, there's the added benefit that we won't be using Earth's resources or contributing to heavy industry pollution on Earth to support space exploration. We can also launch those resources from the moon back to Earth and use them in Earth orbit to create things like bigger satellites and telescopes and space stations and even solar power stations that would beam energy to Earth and make it cheaper for everyone. There's a whole bunch of other technologies that we need to advance to, and all of these have benefits to Earth. And actually, that's a fundamental consideration of space exploration. How do we funnel the technology that we're developing for the moon and Mars and beyond back to humanity, no matter where we are in the solar system? Just like NASA has done for decades, with over 2,000 spin-off technologies being created from the technologies that were created for the space program. Here's an example. What happens if an astronaut is stationed at the future Artemis Base Camp and suddenly she needs surgery, like stat. It's a three-day trip home, she doesn't have time for that, and it's a really intensive surgery that her fellow astronauts like aren't trained to do. Then the surgeon actually lives on Earth. 
What do you do? Well, NASA has been thinking about this, and what we need are robotic surgical technologies. In the near term, they would be controlled by surgeons on Earth, but eventually they would be autonomous. Now imagine the applications for Earth. Everyone, everywhere, no matter where they are in the world, would have access to better healthcare. The science community is also really interested in the moon, and not just because sending humans and robotic explorers to the moon will help us understand more about our closest neighbor. From a human exploration perspective, we have a lot to learn when it comes to living in reduced gravity or deep space radiation environments. We really have no idea how our bodies are going to respond to living on the moon or Mars long term. We know, of course, what 1G, aka Earth gravity, does to our bodies. It's great. But we also know what zero G long term does to our body, and it's not so great. But will we have the same issues in the moon's one sixth gravity or Mars's one third gravity? We just don't know yet. And we also don't know what kind of science and technology these discoveries will unlock for improving human health overall. Same for deep space radiation. Our atmosphere thankfully shields us from a lot of the sun's radiation, but when you're out at the moon or even Mars, you don't have that luxury. So how do we prevent the radiation from penetrating our bodies? We can't have all of the astronauts getting cancer. And what will these discoveries mean for preventing and curing cancer here on Earth? Okay, now that we've figured out how to live on the moon and we've learned a lot more about sustainable space exploration, it's time to go to Mars. We could launch everything straight from Earth, but as we just talked about, that's pretty inefficient. What's more efficient is actually launching things into the solar system from the moon. So in the future, we could be building and fueling rockets on the moon before launching to Mars. And we can even use the moon as like a gas station pit stop for people venturing from Earth to Mars and beyond. The US is not the only country looking to establish a permanent presence on the moon by the end of the decade. China and Russia are also in this new moon race. And we're all competing right now for the lunar south pole because that's where the water is, this key resource that we all want and need to tap into. There's a lot of concern right now that if China gets there first, they're gonna take it all for themselves and they're not gonna play nicely because they didn't sign the agreement that says, hey, we're all friends, we're all gonna share resources like the US did. But despite that agreement, it's pretty unclear who can do what on the moon, Mars, and beyond. The US-backed Artemis Accords are the biggest thing that the world is doing right now in attempts to all collectively come together to agree on these standards. 36 countries have signed up right now to collectively decide who can do what, who can own what, and what happens when something goes wrong. But China and Russia, they're not signing it, and they're not going to, which is a major issue. Two of the three major world powers not signing this thing that the rest of the world is trying to sign? Are we gonna end up with a uh, US and its allies versus China and Russia? Wait, 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 I'm getting deja vu. Race to the moon for nationalistic interests. Hasn't this already happened before? Yeah, because we didn't go to the moon initially for exploration, science, or curiosity. We went because of political tensions with the Soviet Union, this little thing called the Cold War. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Landing humans on the moon and returning them safely back to Earth was considered the ultimate proof that the United States' way of life, government, and even its technology were all superior to its communistic Soviet Union rivals. We're living in the space race 2.0, guys. Like, it's happening right now. So wait, was it all worth it back then? Like, why are we doing it again? And how did we get here? It's nearly impossible to quantify just how important the Apollo missions were and still are, because the reality is Apollo has contributed to nearly every single facet of our modern lives. And it goes so much further than just securing a more or less free and democratic world or learning more about the moon and how old it is and what it's made of. It's the technology that is just mind blowing and there's no way I could cover it all, but here are my favorite three examples. We have cell phones, tablets, laptops, and other handheld electronics today because of the need during the Apollo missions to miniaturize electronics. Even the cameras in our phones and computers were brought to us by the Apollo program. So thank you NASA for letting me film TikToks and take Zoom meetings. 
Today, airplanes use computers to fly rather than mechanical inputs. It's called fly-by-wire and you've probably heard of it. It's also in our cars. It's what makes cruise control and other things work. This technology was developed for the Apollo program to safely navigate the astronauts to the moon and back. And then NASA spent years working to make sure that it could get into the hands of the airline and automobile industries. Okay, get this. Food is safer to eat than ever before because Pillsbury, yes, that Pillsbury, needed a better way to test their food that they were providing for the astronauts for contamination. Before Apollo, food companies just spot checked the food at the end of the manufacturing line, which means that they only tested a small percentage of the entire batch before it left and hit shelves. And that's kind of bad and gross if you ask me, and that's why we had so many foodborne illnesses back in the day. But NASA had contracted Pillsbury to make the astronaut food for Apollo, and NASA said, no way, that process is not good enough, come up with something else. And thus this thing called HACCP was developed, and it is still the global food safety standard today. With HACCP, they continuously monitor the production throughout the entire life cycle, checking at each critical stage that an item is safe to continue on. Okay, wow, that all seems important, but how much did it cost? Between 1960 and 1973, the US spent about $25.8 billion on the Apollo program. Today, that's about $250 billion. And while this may seem a lot, it was only 4% of the US federal budget back then. And today, the military alone gets 12%, while NASA gets a mere fraction of a percent. But even more important is that for every $1 they spent on the Apollo program, five to $7 in value was created by spawning new industries, new and miniaturized technologies, new production processes, and new jobs. In fact, over 400,000 people across 20,000 companies and universities worked on the Apollo program. The money we spent on the Apollo program was well worth it, I'd say, and that is not just because I'm a huge space nerd, though that is a contributor, but I hope to convince you in this video that it is worth it. Not only did Apollo win us the Cold War, but it also resulted in giant leaps forward in medicine, aeronautics, space, technology, electronics, and so much more that we still use today. So, if it was so beneficial, why did we stop going? Why has it been 50 years since we've been back? Well, interest started dramatically declining after the Apollo 11 landing. Even though 650 million people worldwide watched Neil Armstrong land on the moon, people just stopped watching. Scientific research and technological advancements were actually deprioritized at the government level, and that was the focus of the additional Apollo landings after 17. It was also, as we just saw, very expensive, and even though we just argued for the value of it, Congress said, no, I want to take that money and put it somewhere else, ahem, the military. It was also pretty risky, technologically speaking. I mean, did you know that the walls of the lander were only as thick as construction paper? Construction paper I can literally poke a hole through? Yeah, engineers were optimizing for mass and they had to cut where they could. And a lot of the design decisions they made back then for whatever reasons they were made would never fly now. All things considered, things went pretty well for the Apollo program after the tragic Apollo 1 fire. But when things started getting really bad on Apollo 13, signals started going off at home with rising fear that we were gonna lose more astronauts. So in 1970, just about one year after Neil and Buzz stepped on the moon, President Nixon said, no, we're done. We're gonna cancel the remaining flights. And the focus instead turned to low Earth orbit and figuring out how to safely live and work in space and the effects of zero gravity in the space environment on the human body, which are all really important and it's a really good thing we did that. But no one thought it would be over 50 years until we went back. So why is it taking so long? Like we went to the moon initially, we haven't been back because of politics. It's literally political whiplash out here, y'all. Every four to eight years, we get a new president with a new agenda. One president will direct NASA to focus its attention on one thing, and then in a couple of years, a new president comes in and says, scrap that, do this instead. In the early 2000s, President Bush asked NASA to find a replacement for the space shuttle and take humans back to the moon. Finish assembly of the International Space Station. The crew exploration vehicle will be capable of ferrying astronauts and scientists to the space station after the shuttle is retired. 
but the main purpose of this spacecraft will be to carry astronauts beyond our orbit to other worlds. So they created what's called the Constellation Program, and this included the Orion crew capsule, the Ares rocket, and the Altair lunar lander. But then when Obama took office, he scrapped the program. So five years and nine billion dollars wasted. Instead, he asked NASA to start creating a different rocket called the SLS or the Space Launch System, or what some people call the Senate Launch System because it is just a massive disaster. The plan was to use SLS and Orion, thankfully they kept that from the Constellation program, to send humans to an asteroid by 2025. Then Trump took office and he said, we're not going to an asteroid, we're going back to the moon. And honestly, for good reason, because China and Russia had also started to revamp their lunar programs. So what happened? Well, thankfully, we didn't just scrap the technology again. We kept SLS and Orion, but the mission was redirected again. Back to the moon we go, and thus the current Artemis program was formed. Oh, and remember how there was a lander in the original Constellation program in the early 2000s? Yeah, we had to bring that back because we have to somehow land on the moon. Biden is actually an anomaly here. He's the first president in this millennia that hasn't redirected space programs already in the works. And maybe that's because we've already spent so much time and effort and everyone is already so mad about how the last 20 years have gone that he's like, I'm not touching that. Or maybe, just maybe, we're finally making long-term progress with the value Capitol Hill places in space exploration. Maybe. So, what now? Our return to the moon will be different than the last time. Lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. The Artemis program is making progress, even though they've had a lot of delays. Artemis 1 finally launched in November of 2022, and it was an uncrewed test flight around the moon and back safely to Earth. Artemis 2, the first crewed mission back, will happen just next year in 2025. And though it's not a landing, that comes later in Artemis 3 in 2026, it's still equally as important for us to test these new technologies, just like we sent Apollo 8 to the moon before we sent Apollo 11. With the U.S. back on the moon for the first time in over 50 years, the age of lunar exploration is upon us. Oh, I'm getting chills. Commercial technologies and services are maturing so that people will have access to communication and navigation, transportation, power, everything on the moon. The moon is also becoming more and more accessible to companies and countries who haven't yet been to the moon, with commercial companies providing lunar landing and transportation services at a much lower rate than we've ever had before, and hopefully it's just going to get cheaper and cheaper. And what's wild to me is that we get to live during this time, this time where humanity is embarking beyond our home planet permanently for the first time ever, and that some of us are getting to work on these technologies. I mean, I got to work on Orion, which is the crew capsule, as we just talked about, and I have some really good friends who are responsible engineers on these lunar landers and the science and technology payloads that we're sending to the moon. That is wild. And it's also so important for all of the reasons that we've already talked about here, but also from an inspiration standpoint, because this is our Apollo.